All right, Bridge Point, how are we doing in the room at Tyrone? We good? Right, you look good. You got some smiles. I like it. I want to welcome everybody who's joining us at our downtown campus out in Seminole online campus. Welcome. Whether you're traveling for the holiday weekend, you're on summer vacation, you're joining us on one of our campuses. We're glad you're with us today at Bridgepoint. Seeing that it is technically July 4th weekend, July 4th being only a couple of days away, figured it would be a good day, a good time for us to talk about freedom. And so I'm going to jump right in with a question for us to consider. Don't shout out your answer. Don't answer it out loud. I want you just to think about this. We're going to land here for a minute. Here's the big question. What does freedom look like to you? What does freedom look like to you? What does freedom mean to you? How do you understand freedom? What does it look like to to exercise your freedom? And what does it look like to live in freedom in your everyday life? lives. What does freedom look like to you? Now on July 4th, for many of us, freedom tends to look like a day off of work. We're kicking back, we're relaxing with family, with friends. Maybe it's spending some time out by the pool or at the beach, throwing something on the grill, maybe getting on the boat. It's it's parties, parades, fireworks. But, But for those of us who know what it looks like to celebrate our freedom, July 4th means tuning in to ESPN and watching the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Competition. You're laughing because I'd imagine you know what that is. Who all is familiar with the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Competition? Man, a lot of you guys. All right, freedom, right? Y'all know what it's about. If you're not familiar, it's not just a cute little competition. No, this is a big deal. And it actually competitive eating is considered to be a professional sport. It's part of the MLE, the Major League Eating. So you've got professional baseball and football, basketball, hockey, soccer, and professional eating. Something I wish I had known about prior to going off to seminary and becoming a pastor, because I guarantee you I could be a professional eater. All you do is eat. I eat three meals a day, sometimes more, and I snack in between. I've been training for years. I'll let you know if I'm going to consider a career change or not. But every year on July 4th, Major league eaters, professional eaters are invited to this competition to see how many hot dogs they can eat in 10 minutes. And the reigning champion from last year is Joey Jaws Chestnut. Y'all know Joey Chestnut? Joey the Jaws Chestnut. He won the championship last year. He won, he took the title last year eating 63 hot dogs. That's eight less than he won with the, the year before. 63 hot dogs. Friends, nothing screams freedom like watching someone devour 63 hot dogs. 63 tubular pork part hot dogs. That's 15 pounds of meat, 15,000 calories. They're getting the hot dog and the bun. They're dipping it in the water. They're putting it in their mouth so it can go down the gullet and they're jumping around to shift it in their belly to make sure they can squeeze as many hot dogs in their belly as they can in 10 minutes. Nothing says freedom like that, right? America, happy 4th of July. But what if it's not cramming hot dogs in your mouth or or the pool parties or throwing something on the grill or being out on the boat or the beach and the fireworks? What if freedom is something else? So I'll ask you again, what does freedom look like to you? And I want to go to a definition of freedom. The definition of freedom is this, the right to act, speak, or think as one wants without hindrance or restraint. The right, that's important, to act, speak, or think as one wants without hindrance or restraint. And for many of us, we we personalize this freedom. It becomes about us. It's me, myself, and I. It's about our individual rights. It's about our personal autonomy. It's about independence. And as a result, we begin to use our freedom, exercise our freedom as a license to act, speak, or think however we want when we want, where we want. Why? Because we want to, and we do so without hindrance or restraint. But what about freedom from a distinctly Christian point of view? What does the Bible tell us about freedom? And not just freedom in general, but what does the Bible say about the freedom that we have been offered, the freedom that has come to us, and the freedom that we are invited to live into, in and through Jesus Christ? Is Christian freedom, is the freedom that Jesus brings to us about 
personal freedom alone? Is it about autonomy? Is it about our independence? Is it a license for us to do what we want, when we want, where we want? Why? Because we want to without hindrance or restraint. Or is Christian freedom, is the freedom that we have been offered and received in and through Jesus, is it something else? Is there more to Christ-centered freedom than just us? This is what I want to explore today. And the passage of scripture that I want us to look at contains a message about freedom, but not freedom in general, not necessarily the freedom that we talk about this week and this weekend, but what freedom looks like through Jesus in our everyday lives. The, the, the passage that we're gonna look at comes from the book of Galatians. So if you have your Bible with you, go ahead and turn to it. If you wanna pull out the Bible app on your phone or if you wanna follow along on the screen, we'll have the words up there, but we're gonna be in Galatians chapter five. It's in the New Testament. I'll give you a minute to turn there. Galatians 5, it's a, it's a book of the Bible, but it's actually a letter. It's a letter that was written by a guy named Paul to a specific group of people, a specific group of Christians in a region of Galatia. And Paul, he has this personal connection with these people in Galatia. He met them there when he was traveling through on one of his missionary journeys. And he shared the message of Jesus with them. All right, he's already talked with them, uh, told them all about Jesus, who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, the significance of his sacrificial work on the cross and teaching the Galatians that salvation, freedom, it, it comes through faith in Jesus accepting him as Lord and Savior. It comes through faith in Jesus and faith alone. And what happens after, after Paul has shared the gospel message with them is, is they believe. Their lives change. They put their faith in Jesus. They, they experienced and received the freedom of salvation and things were going well, right? They were doing the Christian things. They were going to church on Sundays, getting coffee and donuts, kids and kids point. They're eating Chick-fil-A. They're doing all the Christian things, everything that needed to be done as a Christian. It was great until not long after Paul left Galatia, there was a group of religious leaders, Jewish religious leaders that came in and they started adding some things to what Paul had taught them. They were, they were suggesting some things, some teaching that countered Paul's teaching, presenting a different gospel, a different way to understand salvation, teaching that downplayed the work that Jesus had done and what had been accomplished through Jesus on the cross. You see these religious leaders, they were telling the Galatians that faith in Jesus, it was good. It was needed. It was important, but it was not enough to save them. You see, they claimed that, that salvation was dependent upon strict obedience, strict obedience to the law, to the Jewish law, the Mosaic law, what we find in the, what was in the first books of the, of the Torah, consider the Torah, the first five books, of the Old Testament. And, and they also were teaching that everything that was contained in the law, every, every prescription, every outline, every do and don't in the law, it had to be strictly followed in order for someone to experience God's grace, experience forgiveness, and to live their life in freedom. And so the main reason that, that Paul was writing this letter was to remind the Galatians what he had already taught them. He was writing them to remind them the gospel that he had taught them and the gospel that was presented and shared as Jesus walked and lived on this earth. And he was also writing to speak out against the false teaching that had entered into Galatia. He, he was pushing back against the, the teaching of these Jewish religious leaders. And he wanted to urge them, the, the Galatians, that they did not need to add anything to their faith in Jesus. And so this is why Paul, this is who Paul is writing to. This is why Paul is, is writing. This is the context. This is what's going on. And Paul confronts this particular issue at the very beginning of chapter five in the book of Galatians. And I'm gonna look at it from the message interpretation. Eugene Peterson, he interprets the Bible in this way. It's easy to relate and understand, but I like the wording of it. So Galatians five, Paul jumps right on this topic and he begins to address this issue in this way. He writes, Christ has set us free to live a free life. So take your stand. Never again let anyone put a harness of slavery on you. Friends, Paul presents his, his argument in a clear and concise way as clearly as he possibly can. He's saying Christ has set us free to live a free life. He, he's emphasizing what he's already taught them, what they already know to be true. He's emphasizing that our freedom 
freedom from the weight of sin, freedom from the weight of a life that's not measuring up, the things that separate us from God. He's saying that freedom has already been granted to us through Jesus. He's saying the debt has already been paid. The work has been accomplished. The the declaration of, of independence from obedience to the law, having to strictly follow the law, it has been signed. And Jesus' sacrifice on the cross has already set us free. And once we place our faith and our trust in Jesus, then the only thing left for us to do is to be free. He says, Christ has set us free to live a, a free life. And so he's also going on to offer this, this clear warning. He says, so take your stand, right? And so stand firm, hold on to this teaching, hold on to this truth, hold on to it, trust it, trust the gospel that I presented to you that I've already taught you. Don't give in to these other ways. Don't, don't second guess and turn back. Don't fall away, wander away and try and add certain things. He says, don't let anyone put a harness of slavery upon you. And this harness of slavery that that he's implying here could be understood as the Jewish law. And and real quick, this probably comes as a reminder. We've talked about it from time to time, but, but the Jewish law is what contained all of the commands, all of the sacrifices, all of the rituals, all of the do's and the don'ts that God's people needed to know in order to know what was sin and what was not considered sin. We could understand, understand sin as anything that separates us from God. You see, the purpose of the law was to help God's people identify the problem areas, the areas where they started to veer off or the areas where they went out of bounds a little bit. And it also outlined the sacrifices that were required for God's people in order to receive the forgiveness from wherever it is they went out of bounds or the misguided steps that they took. It helped them receive the forgiveness to be made right with God and also to be brought back into relationship and in good standing with God. In the past, I've equated this to like a check engine light on a car, right? A check engine light is what highlights the problem. It it helps identify the fact that there is a problem, but it does not fix the problem. A mechanic has to fix the problem. The, The law was like the check engine light that highlighted the fact there was a problem, but it did not do anything to save them or fix the problem. And the foundation of Paul's argument here is that Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross is the sacrifice, is the very sacrifice, the only sacrifice needed to bring us back into right relationship with God once and for all. You tracking with me? And so Paul is saying that that if we go back to uh, viewing salvation as a list of rules and requirements that we find in the law, making it about trying to live up to these legalistic standards, then Jesus's sacrifice would actually be irrelevant. And the work that Jesus did on the cross would be deemed unnecessary. And he's saying that's not the gospel and that's not true. He's saying this adding the law, strict obedience, it contradicts the gospel message and it's not what I taught you. So coming back to to our text, Paul's point is, is simple. It's that Jesus has set you free. He's done the work on the cross. So don't add or place these additional requirements to your salvation. It's an unnecessary weight. It's an unnecessary harness. It keeps you strapped in, locked in. It's this unnecessary burden that will only keep you from experiencing what it means to truly be free. This is the primary point of Paul's letter throughout Galatians. But I want us to keep reading because Paul has more to say on freedom. And he gives another example of what freedom is not and what it does not mean to live a free life. Look what Paul goes on to say just a few verses later, picking up in verse 13. Paul writes, it is absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life, right? He's reiterating it. You have been set free through Jesus. He's saying here again, it is absolutely clear. I want you to know this. It is clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Friends, up to this point, Paul has been telling them, you are free. 
Jesus has done the work. It's already been taken care of. There's no more law, no more burden of the law, no more strict obedience and requirements. He's saying, go and be free. Live this life of freedom. Stop carrying this unnecessary burden and weight with you. Go have fun, experience freedom, live a little. And then all of the sudden, Paul here, he starts pumping the brakes a little and he says, but just don't go out and be too free which leads me to believe that Paul had two kids under the age of 10 when he was writing this letter. And here's why. Believe it or not, in the James family, we have rules. We have rules that we follow, rules that we're supposed to follow. And we follow these rules. And these rules are strictly enforced at all times by our kid's mother, sometimes enforced by me. But we have rules. And if you don't follow the rules, then you go to time out. You need to separate yourself for a little bit to get yourself right before you come back and try and be right with us. And our two kids, they respond differently to both rules and timeouts. Our oldest daughter, Hannah, she's 10 years old, going on 18, and she is our rule keeper. She is the Jewish religious leader in the house. She is black and white when it comes to right or wrong. She is either fair or it's unfair. And when she lets us know when rules are broken, when when things are not right and not going as they should, especially when it has to do with her five-year-old little brother. But when she gets in trouble and she gets put in timeout, she's tough on herself. She doesn't like going out of bounds. She doesn't like breaking the rules. She does not like messing up. So she's really tough on herself. But after she gets some time out, after she gets some time away and we talk with her and we say, okay, now, now go and just be, be careful, be, be thoughtful. Don't make the same mistake. You're free to go. The prison warden has let her go and she sits there and she's like, I'm fine. She, she doesn't kind of run off and step into her freedom. She, she stays back. She's, like I said, she's hard on herself. She doesn't want to do anything to get back in trouble. She carries this, this burden of what she's done and how she's messed up back into her free life. She carries the burden and, burden and does not live into her freedom. But her five-year-old brother, on the other hand, he is someone entirely different. He is our limit pusher. Cameron, he's five. He laughs in the face of discipline. That rules are only in place to be broken. We don't tell him what to do. This is his perspective. He tells us what we're gonna do. And sometimes I listen because I'm scared of him. He's five, but he's got a strong will. He's strong, but he gets in timeout all the time. I'd say five times an hour. He is constantly, he's in isolation. We've got to lock him up. He's in timeout, but we go and we talk with him and we we try and get him back on the right path. And then when it's time for him to go, when we say, all right, you're you're free, go. Just just don't mess up. He does that kind of walk by you, look, eyeing you up and down, like I'm free. That's it, I'm, I'm gone. He gives us the peace sign. He runs out, he'll steal my truck keys, go pick up kids from preschool. They'll hit the town, get ice cream. He is free to do whatever he wants to do. Does not think about the burden of what got him in time out in the first place. He's not bothered by rules and he takes his freedom too far. He runs off and he lives out his freedom from time out, just pushing the limits and walking the very edge to see how far he can go. And I'd imagine this isn't just true in my house. I'd imagine this is true in some of our other homes as well, but we see it play out in other ways as well. Think about the freedom that you get when you get your keys to the car when you're 16. You got your license, it's lawful. It's okay to go out and to drive your car, but you can push it a little bit too far, right? You you could break curfew. You could could go over the speed limit. Think about when when you're 18 and you're off to college, you're out of the parent's house and you're an adult now. You're freed from those rules. You're freed from parental guidance and strict observance to their laws, but you can take it too far. 21, you're free lawfully to consume alcohol legally, but there can be some times and some ways for you to push that freedom and abuse that freedom and just push the limits. You graduate college, you're free to go and live the American dream. You can do what you want. The the sky's the limit. You're free to go and get that job and and to make that money and, and to go, but you can get so focused on that freedom that you start veering away from any kind of boundary. There's no hindrance or restraint. 
That's the last place I'm going to end the example because the reality is after that, you get married and you have kids and you realize you have absolutely no freedom at all. Or at least that's what y'all tell me. That's not my perspective. That's what I'm hearing from you guys. Friends, what, what Paul is saying here is that while freedom that Jesus brings is not about the law, it's not about having to, to walk through life, making sure you don't mess up or living in fear that you're gonna mess up. But he's also saying it's also not freedom that Jesus brings is also not a careless free-for-all. It's not burden to the law, but it's not a careless free-for-all. It's not an excuse for us to do whatever we're, we have the right to do, whatever we want to do, whatever we're entitled to do. If you were with us last week at the end of our series, talked about entitlement and generosity. It's not about our entitlement. It's not a license for us to do as we please and permission to chase after our every want, wish, and desire to do what we want, when we want, where we want, however we want, because we want, without hindrance, or restraint. Paul says this way of living is not what it means to be free either. And he even says it can destroy the freedom that you have been given. So what we have so far is, is Paul has presented these two different views of freedom, two different views that are at opposite extremes. They're at opposite ends of the spectrum, both of which being a misuse or a misrepresentation of what it means to be free and why Jesus has set us free and what it looks like. It's not to be lived out by this, by, by this rule-keeping system or strict obedience and these expectations and requirements. It's not meant to be lived out by trying to measure up and trying to make sure that we're, we're doing all the right things and not doing all the wrong things. And at the same time, he's saying freedom is not to be lived out by this selfish pursuit, a self-centered pursuit of what we want, what we're entitled to and what we have the right to do with a careless disregard for any boundaries, or anything around us or anyone around us. Paul says, both of these extremes are examples of misusing, potentially even destroying, making a mess of the freedom that you have been given. And, and it's far away from resembling the type of freedom that Jesus wants for us. And so the, the question remains, what does freedom look like from a Christian point of view? Well, I want you to pay attention to what, what Paul says next uh, because verse 13 continues with Paul writing this. Rather use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows. For everything we know about God's word is summed up in a single sentence. Love others as you love yourself. That is an act of true freedom. He says, rather use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows. Friends, after a couple of examples of what not to do, Paul finally gets to an example or a description of what freedom looks like and how they are to use their freedom once they have been set free through faith in Jesus. He says, use your freedom to serve one another in love which is where it can get challenging because I don't know if this is what you were expecting. If you haven't read this before, it might be a little bit confusing and you're thinking it's a little bit of a curveball. Why? Because Paul is presenting a different perspective of freedom, one that is completely different from what he's been talking about up to this point and one that's completely different from the definition and the understanding we tend to take on uh, when it comes to freedom in this place and in our lives. He doesn't offer them this new kind of new law. He doesn't give them an overly legalistic view to be fearful about measuring up. There's no set of rules or requirements of what it looks like to be free. He doesn't tell them also to go and just do whatever you want. You're free to go, live your life, live a little. He doesn't say push the limits or exercise your rights at all costs. And he doesn't tell them to focus solely on their freedom or to protect their liberties or to exercise their rights without hindrance or restraint. No, instead, the focus of their freedom is somewhere else. Better yet, the focus of their freedom is to be on someone else. The focus here that Paul is saying to them of, of where their freedom is to be directed, how it is to be used, what it is to look like is focused primarily on other people. 
doesn't take away from their freedom or their rights, but it's not the focus. The focus is on other people. This is a, a, a different understanding of freedom, and it's one that can be challenging because it invites us to look past ourselves. Right? It, it's a perspective of freedom, what it means to be free, what it means to not be bound to anything, held back by anything, hindered by anything, a harness upon us. It's to be free, but it's one that invites us and calls us to move beyond ourselves and directs us toward the good of others, describing that kind of freedom as an act of love, demonstrating, revealing, exemplifying love. You see, he makes it clear here that the freedom we receive in Jesus is freedom that has less to do about us, what we got to do. That's the law or what we get to do, what we have the right to do. That can be careless. It can be destructive, but instead is a freedom that has more to do with the opportunity for us to use our freedom alongside the people around us. And this isn't anything that Paul is saying because he gets anything out of it. And this isn't something I'm using here because I get anything out of it. This isn't some just random thought that Paul thought he would just add there and hopefully it would help them understand. No, this is the very message and way of life that we see with Jesus all throughout the scriptures as Jesus walked and lived the earth in his ministry and throughout his life. It's the same message. It's the way in which Jesus used his freedom throughout his interactions, his conversations, his preaching, his entire ministry. Think about it. Being that Jesus is God himself, God incarnate, come down. God has come down in the form of Jesus. Jesus is God. Jesus was free to do whatever he wanted to do whenever he wanted to do it, however he wanted to, wherever. Why? Because he is God. He was not bound to any religious or, 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 or political or social structures. He wasn't held back by anything. He was also free. He could do a whole lot of stuff. He could walk on water. He could turn that water into one. He could do anything and he could brush it off as his God-given Right, but Jesus did not use his freedom as a license to act, speak, or think however he wanted. Here's the catch without hindrance or restraint or consideration for anyone around him. He did not use his freedom as a license to live this self centered, self focused life with a careless disregard for the people around him. It wasn't a self-indulging kind of freedom or a personal gain kind of freedom or an entitled, my right, what I can do because I'm free to do kind of freedom. No, Jesus used his freedom for the purpose of bringing freedom and the message of freedom to other people. Did y'all catch that? Jesus used his freedom, not about himself, what he could do because he is God, He used his freedom to present a message and to live into a message of freedom for other people, inviting those other people into a way of life, a gospel and understanding a truth that could set them free and have them experience the meaning and the significance of freedom. And friends, what Paul is suggesting to the Galatians and what Paul is suggesting here to us is that when we put our faith in Jesus, when we experience this, this freedom in our lives, we're, we're set free to live our lives the very same way. Using our freedom, taking the, the joy and the celebration of what it means to truly be set free and using it as an opportunity to take that same message to the people around us and to invite them in to the way of life that can set them free as well. Here's the big idea I want us to take today. The freedom Jesus brings to us is for us, it's for his love to flow through us. The freedom Jesus brings to us is for his love. So his love can flow through us. And so let me ask you uh, again, as we kind of land the plane, as we wrap up today, What does freedom look like to you? How are you living a free life? Some of us may not have ever experienced that freedom. 
placing our trust and our faith in Jesus. We, we may not have, have, have truly embraced the work that Jesus has done for us on the cross. And we're still bound to these things of trying to do better, trying to do more, trying to earn our way to God and trying to earn our way to salvation and experience freedom. Let me remind you or tell you that Jesus has set you free. How are you using your freedom? Is your freedom, is the freedom that you have been invited to take on and to live into, is it all about you? Or does it resemble the love and the mercy and the grace that Jesus has offered you? Does your freedom consider the needs for freedom or the message of freedom to the people around you? Friends, Paul started the, the chapter five telling us that Christ has set us free. Jesus has set us free to live a free life. So I think the only question that, that's left for us to consider is how are we going to use our freedom? And what are we going to use our freedom for? The invitation and the opportunity is there. The response is up to us. Will you pray with me? God, we're reminded as we explore these, uh, these words in your word that, that Jesus has come to, to accomplish what we cannot accomplish on our own. The, the, the gift of freedom and salvation that's been offered to us is only possible through putting our faith and trust in Jesus and trusting in the accomplishment of what's been done on the cross, the forgiveness that's been offered the freedom that we're invited to take on. And so I pray that as we celebrate freedom this weekend and this week, that we will celebrate the American freedom that we have and we will not hold back in that, but we will not separate it from the freedom that has been we are invited to take on and to receive through Jesus. Lord, we have been set free by you so that your love and your mercy and your grace can flow through us. May we extend the freedom we've been given to those around us in the same way that was modeled and revealed to us in your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.